Let's start getting ready to get started here. All right, <clears throat> let's get started. We've still got some ground to cover. Now, first off, uh, please give us the contact of the couple who specializes in body parts, creative miracles. All right, it's very easy. Go to my website. I will the when I get back in the states, it'll be two weeks, and I'll speak at our national conference in Denver. And then from there, beginning the I think the first week of July, I will be in Arkansas. I will be speaking for them in Arkansas. So if you go to my website, go to the schedule page. Look at the Arkansas, it's called Rogers, Arkansas. If you find that, that's their contact info. I, I don't have it offhand or I'd give it to you, but that's the best way I can tell you. If I was going to get in touch with them, that's how I would contact them. So, um, that's either, Their name is Wayne and Sandy Warmack. Wayne and Sandy Warmack. Okay, I think they, they have greater, oh, what is that, ministries? Greater Works Ministries. I think that's it. So, anyway, that's, that's the basic information. The rest you can get off the website. Now, uh, when you prayed yesterday for, my, for me, my leg was lengthened by one and a half inches. Amen. Okay. Amen. Okay. Good. Good. says, I have five other ailments. Why didn't I ask for Jesus to heal them too? <laughs> I don't know. Why didn't you? See, I told you. You don't have to put up with anything. Amen. There we go. That's it. Amen. Just, there you go. Just... It, I, I, okay, let me tell you something. Look, <clears throat> I was in Valparaiso, Indiana, and there was a, well, actually before that, I was in Florida, and there was a young girl there, a, a father and brought a little girl. We were meeting in a house. We ministered. Her father was a drug tester for a major drug company, and he tested the effects of drugs and things like that. But anyway, he brought her in there, and <clears throat> She, this little girl was about eight years old, and she was sitting on the front row taking notes. I mean, literally just amazing young lady. And when we finished, I said, okay, who needs healing? And she said, well, I, I have a food, al food allergy, and I can't eat seafood. And I said, okay. It was about 11 o'clock at night by the time we started praying for people in this house, because question, answers, fellowship. And so I said, okay, name is allergy. I said, you'll go. I said, now you, I said, I just sort of said, go try to eat what you can't eat. Just go eat it. She said, okay, but it's late. Where am I going to find seafood? And the lady in the house said, well, I've got some frozen shrimp in my refrigerator. We'll cook it, and, you know, it'll be good because you're here, and she's here, and you're here, so <laughs> if anything happens, you're here. And I said, okay. So we fellowshiped a while, and she, the lady went and cooked the, the shrimp, and the little girl sat down and ate it and was totally healed, no reaction, nothing. Now, then I went to Valparaiso, Indiana, about a year later, I guess, and we had a, it was a, in a National Guard armory. It was in a big thing and had the people sitting out. And then we were breaking for lunch, and there were people that needed healing. So I said, you know, I don't want you to keep suffering. So I'm telling you, for instance, if you have, say, food allergies. Well, okay, if you come to me with food allergies, all I'm going to do, I probably won't even pray. I'll probably just tell you, go eat what you can't eat. And I said, so if that's you, we're fixing break for lunch, so if you were going to come to me for prayer for food allergy, I'm just telling you, all I'm going to do is tell you, go eat what you can't eat, so just go eat what you can't eat. And we got back, we had four, four people that were healed of food allergies. <laughs> Didn't pray, just said, go do what you can see, and they acted on, on that command, and they did it, and it worked. Amen? So I'm telling you, you don't have to put up with anything. You don't have to wait till tonight. Just decide now. Because it's not going to be, tonight's not going to be theatrical. It's not going to be hoopla. We're not going to put on a show. I'm not going to do anything special. I'm going to be the same way I've been all day long. If you walk up to me and ask me to pray for you, I'm going to pray. We're going to pray. You're going to get healed. It's going to be that way. So why wait? Just go ahead and get it now. I mean, it's going to be Jesus. It's going to be by his spirit. So just be healed and just receive it now for yourself and let God just touch you. He wants to touch you. Right? He wants to touch you so bad he'll wait until I get my hands on you. But he wants to touch you. So you don't have to wait. Amen? All right. Now, uh, real quick, get the others here. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you were talking about a sanctification experience that people used to receive. How do we receive that? What's involved? It's really very simple. The first key to any, to any receiving is to begin to believe. So before you, it's not a process per se, it's just deciding to believe that that, that is possible. If you don't believe it's possible, you can't receive it. But once you believe it's possible, then you can receive it anytime. So you just believe that it's possible and that it's right that you be sanctified and separated. And really what we're talking about is death to that old nature. And you just, uh, just tell God what you want and be serious about it and don't play. And then generally what I would tell people is just, honestly, the easiest way to say it is just get on your face before God. You know, go home, get on your face before God and stay there until it's gone. Don't get up till it's broke. Right? See, most of our problem is not whether God wants to do it, it's whether we have the ability to stay there till we get it. You, know? you ever see people in line that finally just go, hey, this ain't worth the wait, and they just walk out of line and walk off? Well, they're not going to get anything. But if you stay in line long enough, guess what? You'll get it. Right? Most people just don't stay there long enough to actually get it. The waiting isn't on God's part, it's on your part. Okay? So, um, oh, here's a good one. Is there any reason for you to wear the same colored shirts every day with different emblems? Okay, now, I basically have two colored shirts, or two different colors, I have white and I have black, okay? It makes it very easy for me to decide what I'm going to wear each day, all right? I don't have to pick what color goes with what pants, and does this match, does it clash? I have no clue with any of that stuff, all right? All I know is I like what I like, okay? If I like it, I'll wear it. I'm, I'm, I'm like a little kid, I mean, I would wear, you know, purple pants and a green shirt. It wouldn't matter to me. If I liked it, that's what I would wear, okay? I have no clue about how it looks, per se. I mean, if I look at it and go, okay, it looks good, then I'm, I'm satisfied. Now, <clears throat> I will tell you this. I have white and black shirts, and I've been wearing black shirts since I've been here this time, really, all the way through. Reason being is twofold. Number one, it's been fairly cool here, and black shirts keep you warmer. <laughs> right? It absorbs heat. Okay. Number two, how many of you know that black hides fat? <laughs> so, see, you think I wear this beard because I like it. <laughs> you know, when I developed a double chin, I liked the beard. <laughs> okay? when, I, when I get rid of the double chin, I'll quit wearing the beard probably. <laughs> okay? So that's the way you go. So, yeah. <clears throat> the camera puts, for anybody watching by video, the camera puts ten, uh, 40 pounds extra on you. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean... So, no, I'm actually about 20 pounds overweight what I should be, so I don't get a lot of e chance to exercise, so I am working on that at this point. So, now, because I'd rather wear black than suck in for six hours. <laughs> I'm working like that. It's, it's easier. <laughs> okay. So, okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, what was that? Okay. Okay. Okay, that's good. Got that. I'm trying to go through these real quick. Um, oh, Curry, how come it works for you when you do it and it doesn't work for me, others when they do it? Because I'm special and God don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> no. I'm telling you, it works. This has worked for thousands. Okay? It has nothing to do with the person, the special, or no, none, none of that. It, it really has to do with how much you go after it and how much you get rid of those sacred cows and how much you just try to help people. Really, really, that's what it comes down to. I mean, there are details and there are things here and there that you need to, to you know, tweak and fix, but overall, if you do what I tell you to do, it will start working for you. If there's resistance, get used to it. That's what Christian life is. Is resistance. In the early days, the church expected resistance. Nowadays, when you get resistance, we think it's God doing something to hold us back. Or It wasn't any of that. Jesus said that it is impossible to enter the kingdom without much tribulation. There you go. You know, just go tribulate. <laughs> Amen? So, yes, so, now, um, you know, bottom line is you got to do it because it's Bible. So just keep doing it. If you keep doing it, it will work. Okay, that's the easiest way to say it. Amen? Now, please talk on the need for power of agreement in the body or with other believers. Uh, you don't need any. I know that messes you up, but 
uh, there, you do not need the power of agreement to get things done. Now, if there is agreement, that is wonderful. If there's not, do it yourself. Right? Don't blame being alone for anything. It's e Look, we have the idea that you have to get 10,000 people together and we're all praying the same thing and in unity for it to change anything. First off, you can do more with two people than you can with 10,000 because it's easier to get the two in unity than it is 10,000. Right? So, but now, the bottom line is, the power, of, you do not have to have the power of agreement to get the sick healed. If you can get it, great. If you can't, do it alone. Simple as that, right? You're going to stand before God by yourself. That, that answers a lot of the questions I've been getting about, from, uh, apparently from women, that says, what about husbands that don't want their wives to do this? What about husbands that are against this? Should I do this? Should I not do this? Okay, you don't have a choice. Now, understand, I, un I understand what it means to submit to a husband and that kind of stuff, but when, it com when you have to decide between submitting and disobedience, it is better to be disobedient to a husband than it is to be disobedient to God. So you do what God tells you to do. You understand? I'm going to say something here. That I, this is never popular, but it's a fact. When I got married, my wife knew, and she's heard me talk this. So I mean, she's heard me tell about this before, so she knows this. Is, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying this because she's not here. She's not here because she stayed home with my new grandbaby, and she keeps sending me pictures on my iPhone and showing me what I'm missing. <laughs> and so, and so it's not fair what she's doing. It's wrong. <laughs> okay? And so, but when we got married, before we got married, actually I think when I asked her to marry me, we were in a little town walking down a dirt road just kind of walking and talking. And I told her, and at this point I had no clue. I, I didn't know John Lake. I didn't know anything about the ministry. didn't know anything about prophecy or any of that stuff. But I, I told her at that point, I said, if you stick with me, your name will be known around the world. And I had no clue about anything. I said, but I know this. God's got a plan for my life. I don't know what it is, but I know that I'm going to go around the world. And if you stick with me, you'll be known around the world. Now, it wasn't, I wasn't trying to be known, because you can't make yourself known. I mean, it is, especially in ministry, it is almost impossible to make things happen. Do you understand? I mean, you can do some things and their stuff, but if you have any integrity, you won't do it. And so it's impossible to do it without loss of integrity. Now, so you have to let God do it. And I can tell you, I do everything wrong. Everything wrong. I, I don't do anything right to build a ministry. I, I've had people tell me, you should do it this way, you should do it and I don't do it. So I, I've told God before, God, if I'm wrong, the last thing I want to do is lead people astray. I said, if I'm wrong, shut this thing down. Shut it down. Stop it. I don't care because I'd rather it shut down than to continue leading somebody wrong. Amen? And the funny thing is, every time I pray that, the thing explodes. <laughs> Bigger. So obviously God is doing this because I'm not doing it. I, I can honestly tell you I am doing nothing to make this happen. Right? It is it's just gospel. Right? It's just gospel. Just preach the gospel. It works. Now, we, um, when I met my wife, I, I told her, because I've heard all the family-friendly gospel stuff, you know? And I've, I've heard about priorities and all that kind of stuff. Well, I, I told my wife, I said, <coughs> before, I before I actually married her, I said, here's the deal. God called me from a child. He knew me from a child. He saved my life. My mom dedicated me to him. I belonged to him as a child, from a child. Now, I, that doesn't mean I always walked right. I didn't, all right? I was nominal Christian at best for a good 10 years there, and from 9 to about 17, roughly, roughly in that time. Nominal. I knew God was with me. Had some unusual things happen, but I wasn't a good Christian, all right? You know, the way you would think of a good Christian. Well, but I did tell my wife, I said, God had dibs on me before I met you. And I said, I, I know what's taught. I said, but I can tell you this. God will always be first. First. I will obey God regardless of the cost. If God tells me to go, I will pick up and go. If you decide not to go, it won't be me leaving you. It will be you deciding not to follow God. I said, because I'm going to go. And, I, and honestly, we have packed up and moved 
a dozen times across the country here and there and done things. I've quit jobs. I've, uh, I've you name it. I've done, I, I was, you know, blasted by everybody, especially my mother-in-law at that time. Well, she's still my mother-in-law, but she, what I mean is she, <laughs> she, <laughs> she, she blasted me at that time, right? <clears throat> she, when I met my wife, my wife and, well, my wife wasn't really, but my mother-in-law was a Jehovah's Witness. And so, obviously, we didn't see eye to eye on things. I was basically Southern Baptist who had a lot of questions about power. And so, uh, I, I've told people before, you know, the reason I believe the way I do, partly is, and I told my mother-in-law this, I said, it's your fault. I said, you hit me with all your Jehovah's Witness doctrine, I didn't have an answer. Because so all I had was Baptist doctrine. So I went in the Bible and found out we were both wrong. <laughs> and so, I told her, I said, I believe the way I do because of you, a, a lot of it, you know, just research. And so, but for years... She blasted me because I we would pack you know pack up the kids and move across the country and I mean we had nothing. I, you, if I described how we lived, you wouldn't believe it, right? You would not believe it. Uh, it. It wasn't always good. It wasn't convenient. It wasn't comfortable. And my my kids didn't always have the best of everything. And you know just just the way it was. But I was going to find answers that we had to have. Well, my mother-in-law used to tell me, "You're just dragging those kids from pillar to post," you know. And I, I told her, I said, no, you're wrong. I, I don't have a post to drag them to. I'm leaving the pillar, and we're just going out in the middle of nothing. We got nothing to go to. And so, but now my mother-in-law works for me, and she transcribes my CDs. Amen? She saw the change in our life. She, she knew me when I was no good, literally. I mean, I, I, I would have said I loved God, but I wasn't walking with him, you know? I was one of those up-and-down Christians, you know, up, and, oh God, you're awesome, and then backslide and fall, and oh God, well, you know, I'm rotten, no good, how can you ever use me, how can you, and then back up, I mean, it was that way for years and years, I'm telling you, and it just, you know, I, I didn't do anything right, I didn't come up through church, I didn't do all the stuff everybody says you have to do, and come in and come through, I didn't do any of that, you know, we, promotion in the kingdom of God doesn't come by man, yeah. and it doesn't come through the system. Right? Promotion in the kingdom comes by revelation and obedience to it. That's it. You want, you want promotion in the kingdom? Get revelation and be obedient to it. And if you are, God will enlarge your borders. He will enlarge your influence. He will increase your influence. That's all there is to it. Now, <clears throat> but I told my wife, I said, God will always be first. Family will, will always be second, you know. But I will minister and... If ministry, if, if, well, bottom line is family will not get in the way of ministry. My kids know it. My wife knows it. You know, I know that's not popular. I know it's not what's generally preached. But I can tell you this. My kids know. When my daughter, I was in uh, Colorado, and my daughter was giving birth to her first child. And this was about seven, six years ago. Six years ago, I guess it was. And I was doing a DHT right in the middle of it, and right in the middle she started having, well, she went into labor, and she wasn't supposed to be going into labor for another month and a half, two months, something like that. And she started going into labor, so she started having all kinds of complications. And they said all of a sudden her blood pressure shot up. She went into toxic anemia. I mean, everything, boom, 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 boom. So the first thing they did, I'm out there teaching. I'm, you know, a thousand miles away. I flew out. <coughs> I, I didn't drive out, which was unusual, but I flew out. And so... They called me on the phone, and my wife said, Curry, you got to pray. Crystal's going into labor. As it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> the, the baby's going to be premature. He was like two months premature. And when he was born, he was four pounds something. Right? You could, my my son-in-law held him in the palm of one hand. He was that small. And they were saying all kinds of stuff. I mean, it, and none of it was good. And they were telling us, you know, Crystal, she, Crystal was 21 years old, 22, something like that. And sh they said she could... She can, she's already gone into toxic anemia. She could have a stroke. I mean, everything was bad. So <clears throat> I, when I got the message, I would call during the break at the DHT, and I called and put Crystal on, and Crystal said, Daddy, where are you? And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm in Colorado. I'm teaching the DHT. Well, I need you here. Well, that's not easy. I wanted to be there. I, wanted to, I did want to jump on a plane and get back there. But I told her, I said, there's nothing I can do there that I can't do from here. And I said, listen, if I come off the field because the devil attacks you, then from now on, you will be a target every time I go on the field. 
If the devil realizes that's what it takes to get me off the field, you become a target that will always be hit. I said, the best thing I can do for you is pray and stay. And so and that, that's not easy, but that's warfare. And, that's, and you have to be a soldier if you're going to do that. I'm just, that's what Paul told Timothy, be a good soldier. Endure hardness as a good soldier. So it's not easy. If it was easy, he would have said endure easiness. <laughs> he didn't say endure easiness. He said endure hardness. And so I told her I'll be here. <clears throat> and so we would hit this thing. It would go down. And then, you know, by the next break, my wife would call. It, this is going on. Something else would spike. And we just, we fought really for like eight hours. Just boom, boom, boom. It, we'd hit it. It would go away. Something else would pop up. We'd hit that. It would go. It was just constant battle. And in between, <clears throat> that was during the breaks of the DHT. When the break was over, I had to go back on and teach the DHT. And I, and I couldn't get up there and talk about my daughter. We had to go in there and teach what, what worked. You understand? They didn't even know what was going on with my daughter. They had no clue. Only the pastor there knew, and he came to me, and he said, we can, we can postpone this. We can have you on a plane. We can have you back in Dallas in, in just a matter of a couple of hours. And I told him, I said, no, I'll stay. We'll do this. Well, when it was all over, she was okay. The baby was okay. We finished the DHT, and then I had to go on up to Portland, Oregon, and it was two, almost two and a half weeks before I got back home. So my grandson was almost three weeks old before I got to see him for the first time. And I didn't have things on my phone to where I can have pictures and stuff like I do now. So, but the key is, I, I told him, I said, I can't raise my grandkids to tell them that preaching the gospel is the most important thing you can do and then jump off the field and run home just because somebody has a problem. When my grandson looks at all the pictures of his birth and I'm not there, he's going to ask me where I was and I'm going to tell him I was out preaching the gospel and it will emphasize to him that even he is not more important than the gospel. You understand? The gospel, preaching the gospel is the most important thing because it deals with men's eternity not just a temporal feeling good. You get it? Yeah. See, maybe this helps you understand how serious this is. This is real stuff, right? This isn't just preaching. Amen? Now, we're going to get back into the... You do, um, so, now, as far as the designs on my shirt, though, they came this way. I didn't have them made. Okay, so uh, my daughter actually helped... My daughter, Rebecca, helped me pick them out. Because used to I wore vests all the time, the waistcoats, and she said it made me look old and that the kids wouldn't listen to me. <coughs> so, and since the youth is, are the future, we got to get the youth in here. Amen? They got to hear this message. So she took me to a place, I think it was called the Buckle or something like that, and helped me pick out some clothes, and I picked out clothes, and here I am. So, and since we did that, the youth attending our meetings has increased by 30%. <laughs> so... It hasn't made me any younger, <laughs> right? But I've never felt, as my, you know, felt my age anyway. My, my wife will tell you she's raised four kids, and I am the oldest. <laughs> right? so, so that's pretty true. We, we still run through the house and jump over couches and roll around and play and all that stuff. And when we go to Walmart, we still will we'll go to the toilet paper aisle, and the other kids will be on the other side, and we'll toss toilet paper over and see if we can hit each other. Oh, you missed! You know, that kind of stuff. So, I told you, I enjoy life. I'm just, you know, I'm just a big kid sitting in the middle of the floor playing right in the middle of everybody's way. And everybody gets upset, but nobody can say anything because my daddy owns a company. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way I feel. Now, it says, uh, when Scripture says make disciples, does the word mean to, that we witness, that we, yep, that we win the person to Christ, we bring the person to Christ, and help them to maturity, or does it mean get the people saved and let the church disciple them? Okay. <clears throat> Shepherds don't produce sheep. Sheep produce sheep. Right? Sheep produce. Shepherds are to teach you how to win sheep and how to reproduce sheep. See, sheep produce sheep. Everything has to reproduce after its own kind. So the, the pastor isn't supposed to disciple everybody. You're supposed to disciple See, look, you win them. What I, what I tell people is you birth them, you raise them. Right? That's our problem. We have this welfare mentality to where we want to have kids and men want to run around and birth babies and they want to run off and leave the women to, to raise them. No, we need the men that birth them to raise them. Amen? So, if you birth them, you raise them. Real simple. Now, you say, but I can't do that. Then you better get to studying and you better get busy because it's your responsibility. The fivefold ministry is to teach us, to teach the believers how to do the work of the ministry. Well, the work of the ministry is to win the lost and make disciples. You win them. You disciple them. Don't, 
how would you like it if somebody had a bunch of babies and then come all dropped them off all at your house and said, here you go, I birthed them, but you're going to raise them. Well, you might think it's cute because they're babies, but let me tell you, the pastor doesn't feel that way when you start bringing people in and go, here, I got them born again, now here, you raise them up. No, you do your job. Amen? Well, y'all sure are quiet. <laughs> so, now, all right, <clears throat> let's go on. Let's move on into, where am I going to take you? Yep, I got to get, yep, yeah, okay. Tell you what, we're going to work out of the Bible, which is always good, considering this is a Bible seminar. <clears throat> now, so go with me first. Hmm, how do I want to approach it? Let me see. How do I, how do I feel about y'all? Let me think. <laughs> um, all right, <clears throat> yeah. Let's go first. Yeah, might as well. Go with me to uh, Galatians. <clears throat> You'll pardon me, I'm working out of a new Bible, and a thing tries to stick together, <clears throat> and stuff isn't where I left it. Work. There we go. Galatians. I tell you, you ought to live in Galatians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Man, those are, those are some good books. Okay. <clears throat> we were talking about an old covenant, new covenant mindset. Correct? Right? Okay. So go with me to Galatians chapter 3. We will start there. Galatians 3, chapter 3, verse 1. Paul says, Oh, foolish Galatians. Right, well, that's a good way to start a chapter, isn't it? <laughs> Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Now, that's some strong language, right? First off, Jesus said, You call your brother a fool, you're in danger of hellfire. And he just called them foolish Galatians. So apparently, Paul was not really happy with them, right? Pretty upset over the situation. Why? If you read the book of Galatians, the whole idea of Galatians is the fact that Paul was saying, what are you doing? You came into the freedom of Christ, and now you're going back into the law. You come in here, you accept Christ, and you think that's good, and then these Judaizers come in and tell you, oh, that's fine, but now you've got to keep the law. No, Jesus was the end of the law for righteousness for all who believe. So you don't go back under the law for your right standing with God. You fulfill the law. Jesus fulfilled the law for you, and the the Righteous, now get this. The Bible says that the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us when we keep his commandments of love God, love your neighbor. On that hang all the law and the prophets. Simple as that. You don't have to know the you know, 3,000 laws in the Old Testament, right? Which, by the way, there are 1,050 commands in the New Testament. Total of 1,050. But you don't have to know them all. You can, you can keep every one of them without knowing them by loving your neighbor and loving God. And that's it. I mean, isn't that a lot easier? It's a lot easier than trying to memorize all 1,050. Okay? Now, of course, if you memorize all 1,050, you'll probably make a good Pharisee. Okay, so, so. Now, he says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath, past tense, been evidently set forth, crucified among you? <clears throat> this only would I learn of you, now listen, here, he said, I only want to know one thing. I want to ask you one question. This is all I want to know about you. He says, Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? How did you get the Spirit? Was it because you lived right? Or was it because you heard that you can receive it and you did by faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? In other words, you're going to tell me what God started in you? You're going to finish it? You can perfect what God did? That's what he's, he's getting on to. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it yet be in vain? In other words, have you gone through all of this to name Christ? All this for nothing, if you're going to go back under the law? He says, He therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and works miracles among you, does he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Well, we know it's by the hearing of faith and not by the works of the law. So he keeps going back saying, why are you going under the law? Don't go back under the law. He says, even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, that they which are of faith, okay, the same 
are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, not through the keeping of the law. You're justified through faith, not by you keeping the law. He said, <clears throat> he preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. All right? Now, if you wonder what this has to do with healing, it has to do with who you are in Christ, which is how you minister healing. Okay? For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. You hear that? Under the curse. Not curses. The curse, singular, okay, get that. For it is written, cursed, again, singular, cursed, is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. In other words, if you're going to go back into the law, you've got to keep every one of them perfectly because the minute you break one of them, you're guilty of the whole law, okay? So we don't want under the law, right? He says, but... That no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith, not by the law. And the law is not of faith. Hear that? You can keep the law and it not be of faith. And if it's not of faith, you can't please God. So even if you kept the law, you couldn't please God. Right? So why do you try so hard to keep the law? Now, I'm not telling you to live wild and be stupid. Right? I don't actually don't have to tell you that. You'll do that anyway if you want to, right? But now he says, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doth them shall live in them. Now watch. Christ hath, what is hath? Past tense, right? So this is already done, right? Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Is that what it says? From the curse of the law. Not the curses of the law. Deuteronomy 28, I'm sure you've heard it before. Deuteronomy 28, verse 14, verse that says, if you do these things, you're blessed. And from 14 on, it says, if you don't do these things, these are the curses that shall come upon you. Right? And then people have gone back and said, here in Galatians 3.13, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Okay? But, and they go back now, let's go back and see what the curse of the law is. Here's the curse of the law. If you do this, if you don't keep the law, if you don't do everything I told you to do, you'll be, you know, you, all your flocks will die, your animals will die, you'll be cursed, and blah, 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 and it goes on. All this bad stuff, right? Now, the thing is, people have mistaken because of one word, one letter, actually. <laughs> they have turned curse into curses. It does not say you're redeemed from the curses of the law. It says you're redeemed from the curse of the law. Now, the curse of the law is not the curses of the law. The curse of the law is being under the law. You get that? He has redeemed us from the curse of the law. The law was the curse. Being under the law was the curse. Now, the fact that we're redeemed from the curse of the law, guess what? That means that the curses, the curses also don't apply. So in a roundabout sense, people that says we're redeemed from the curses, they are telling the truth, but they're not saying the whole truth because they're saying it still goes back to if you do right, then you'll be blessed, and if you do wrong, you'll be cursed. I got news for you. There's no curse. All right? He said, then what, what happens with this? Oh, there is sowing and reaping, right? But it's not a curse in the sense that God puts these things on you. It is you don't get blessed in the sense that God can't help you in some cases unless someone else bl brings you the help. In other words, you don't have the right to the help yourself. Does that make sense to you? You see it? Now, watch, because he goes on. In verse 13, Christ hath, past tense, redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Again, not curses for us, but a curse. So that's what he took away, was the curse of the law. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Why? So that, verse 14, so that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. The blessing of Abraham. Well, what was the blessing of Abraham? Abraham, the, the whole blessing of Abraham was that the Spirit of God would dwell in men, that he would receive the Spirit. Now watch, I'll prove it. 
He says, so that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So the blessing of Abraham was that we can receive the Spirit, right? That's, that's, that's the point right there. See, people think that, well, uh, the blessing of Abraham is riches and, and, and houses and animals and cars and all this kind of stuff. You know, the blessing of Abraham, see, earthly people think like that. Spiritual people don't look for earthly blessings. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying you won't be earthly blessed. You will. But the idea is that it, we, we're not promised earthly blessing for the sake of earthly blessing. We are promised spiritual blessing, and because we are spiritually blessed, it manifests in the physical too. You understand? But remember what Jesus said? He said, listen, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Isn't that right? He said, listen, don't worry about what you wear, what you eat. Where you go. He, don't worry about that. He said, for all those things are what the Gentiles seek after. Isn't that right? Actually, the word Gentile really is a good word for pagan. In other words, he was saying that's what the pagans search after. That, the pagans are worried about what they're going to eat. The pagans are worried about what they're going to wear. The pagans are worried about their bills getting paid. Why? Because they don't have a God to take care of them. You understand that? He said, don't you be like that. Don't you, for you seek first the kingdom. Why? Because if you seek first the kingdom, then you will be blessed through Abraham. The Spirit will come upon you. That's the blessing of Abraham. And whenever the Spirit comes upon you, then you know that you're in the family. When you're in the family, guess what? You're going to be taken care of. You get that? See, I'm telling you, I have learned. I don't live, now listen, sowing and reaping works, but I don't live by sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping is a natural law. Anybody can sow and reap. But I'll tell you this, you can't sow yourself out of a crisis. Contrary to TV preachers. They'll tell you, if, you're, if you need a miracle, sow right now. And you, sow, and you get, no, no, no. You, see, sowing and reaping, the, the whole idea of sowing and reaping is that you sow, and then there's a growth time, and then there's a harvest time. You don't need sowing and reaping to get out of a crisis. You need a miracle. A miracle is not sowing and reaping. A miracle violates or supersedes, I should say, the, the plan of sowing and reaping. You understand that? So I've learned. I don't live by sowing and reaping. Now, do I sow? Yes. And do I reap? Yes, I do. But I don't live by it. I live by kingdom principle. I don't live by earthly natural law. I live by kingdom law. Kingdom law is I have whatever I need whenever I need it because everything in the kingdom is mine. You understand? Now, the thing is, once I notice that, my giving went up from 10%, the bare minimum, to over 40%. Why? Because I, real, I realize now I can give God more and it won't affect me. Why? Because God just take care of me. Amen? So I'm telling you, if you get a hold of that, it'll change everything. It'll change your finances. It'll change your health. It'll change everything. And I know when I say it'll, it'll change your health, I'm not talking about money, you giving him money. You understand that? I'm talking about you living by this principle, the kingdom principle. Everything he has is yours. If he gave you Jesus, he ain't going to hold nothing else back. If he gave you his best, he's not going to hold back the less. You understand? So, you just need to realize how valuable Jesus is as a gift to you. God gave you his best. So, once he gives you the best, he's not going to hold anything else back. All right? Now, watch. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. In other words, I I'm talking like a human now. I got in trouble. The other, well, I can't think in trouble. I got jumped on. <clears throat> There's a difference. Um, yeah, when I was writing on Facebook before I came over here, some people were writing, and I, and I wrote back and said, you know, some people, some people didn't like our symbol, or our logo, because it has a cross and a crown, and they say that's a Freemason, a Masonic symbol, and we shouldn't use that. And I'm like, I refuse to bow to a devil and stop using the cross and the crown because some cult started using it. I refuse. I'm not going to let some cult, I mean, pretty soon they're going to take every symbol, and then you got nothing. Right? So I refused. So I, I started writing back, and I'm saying, you know what? I'm not going to do that. You know? And I will use the word maybe. Probably shouldn't use the word maybe. I, I probably should have used the word let's pretend or let's suppose or something like that because people are, you know, Christians are extremely nitpicky, right? And you have to be very careful of how you use words. And, but I wrote, you know, maybe, they, maybe we shouldn't be worried about what 
symbol masons use, maybe they should be worried about the symbols we use. You know what I'm saying? Maybe we should be concerned and looking at them and saying, hey, wait a minute, uh, Satanists use a pentagram. Well, who says pentagrams of the devil? That's something they started to use it. Maybe we ought to take it back from them and say, okay, the five-pointed star means the five-fold ministry. <laughs> there you go. How you like that? <laughs> See what I'm saying? And then people got all been out of shape. Oh, you can't. Oh, no, that's a devil symbol. You chicken Christian, you. <laughs> like, that's going to matter. Yeah. I could draw a pentagram or somebody else draw a pentagram up here and stand in the middle of it and I'd preach and the power of God would still be here. Yeah, right. Symbols only have the power you give them. You understand? Jesus got all authority, all power in heaven and earth. Time for you to realize that. If the devil's under your foot, put his symbols under your foot. Right? People talk about, well, the ram's head, that's a symbol of Satanism. Now the ram's head reminds me of the scapegoat that bore the sins that was taken out of the, into, out of the camp and sent out into the desert to die. So, you know, imagine you talking to a Satanist and they got the pentagram on their arm and, you know, tattoo and all that kind of stuff and you go, you, oh, wow. You got, you got a pentagram. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. Hey, you know what that stands for? Can you imagine what they'd be doing? Really? I didn't know that. <laughs> you know? You know? And I, 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 I was writing this stuff on you. I said, maybe the upside down cross should stand not for, you know, rejection of Christianity. Maybe I ought to stand for the humility of the apostle Peter that said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. So instead of the pride to, to come out and go, oh, this is no good, maybe we ought to just turn it around. You know? And of course, Christians jumped all over that. Oh, I can't see. I've been deprogramming people for two years and you, I just refuse to, to believe this stuff and they wouldn't agree with you that that thing. And I'm like, if it took you two years to deprogram somebody, you are weak. <laughs> you understand? It shouldn't take you two years to deprogram anybody. You ought to take two seconds and say, come out. And then disciple them. I mean, I mean, come on, everybody's in some form of deprogramming, right? That's called mind renewal. Every day you renew your mind, you're, you are deprogramming yourself from the way of the world. I mean, so all these people, I mean, they, they, everybody acts like the devil is so big and so bad, and everybody's so afraid of him, and he is a coward. Do you understand? He's not, he's not big and bold, he's a coward. He goes around trying to find those that he can devour. He didn't go around devouring people. He goes around looking for weak Christians that he can eat up. And most Christians are that way that they let him. And they're afraid of the devil. It's crazy. The Bible says that the, the wicked run in and hide and say, oh, there's a lion out in the street when there is no lion. Right? It says that the wicked flee when none pursue. Why? Because they're cowards. But it says the righteous are as bold as a lion. I mean, about time people start getting a little bold. You start realizing the righteousness we have and quit worrying about all this other stuff. But they started saying all these things about the... About, and, I, and it was a wording that I used and, and that kind of stuff that they were all concerned about it. But I'm telling you, at some point we have to realize we have more power than they do. Right? The problem is we don't want to act like it because most of the time people are just ashamed of it. So anyway, <clears throat> sorry about that. I digress. So anyway, <laughs> he says, and I'm going to have to send you to break here in a minute. He says, but I speak after the manner of men though it be but a man's covenant. Now, in other words, oh, that's what got me on this, was I was talking about speaking after the manner of men. Because I wrote on there, I said, look, if you don't like the symbols we use, don't write me about it, because I'm not going to listen. Right? I know how those symbols came about. I know where I got them from. I know the purpose of them. I'm not going to listen to you about it. I said, if you really want to, to get me to listen to you, pray to God and have him tell me. Because I will listen to him faster than I will most other humans. Right? And then they wrote me, how, wow, that, you, you sound like you're a person from another planet. You say, talking about humans. Most Christians call brothers and sisters brothers and sisters. And you call us, you, you're talking about humans. And, and so I just wrote, I just had fun with it after that. I'm just, it, it wasn't going to matter what I was going to say, you know. So I just wrote it back. And I'm like, I am from another planet. It's called heaven. I'm not of this earth. I'm not human. I am born again. I'm a new species. Maybe you're not used to talking to people like me because you ain't run into too many of us, but here I am. You know, and as far as I'm concerned, you're a human. As long as you're not born again, you are a human. So what? But once you get born again, you have God's divine nature. Now, I'm not saying that you're a God. All right? You think that it has to be one of you. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is that you have God's divine nature. 
Well, I have God's divine nature. Over and over again, he says, I talk like a human. What does that mean? I'm not used to talking like a human. I'm used to talking divine things. You see, with most Christians, they just get all bent out of shape over that. They don't like that idea. Well, we, we got to be this. Well, you should not. Well, I, and I can tell I'm talking to a human on that thing, but I'm not. I'm from another planet. I'm from another planet. Now, I'm not saying that I come out of a spaceship somewhere, all right? <laughs> Please, come on. This, this is, I, I, but, I'm, but I'm born from above. I'm not born from here. Amen? So if you don't understand me, guess what? I'm glad. Why? Because they didn't understand my master either. And, and if you don't understand me, it just means that you're probably not born again. Simple as that. So get the Spirit of God and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Amen? But I'm not going to apologize for having my mind renewed. I'm not going to do it. It cost me too much trouble before my mind was renewed. Amen? And I won't sit five minutes and listen to somebody try to unrenew my mind. I won't do it. I refuse to. I'd rather walk alone than to walk with a crowd that's going to go the wrong way. So, okay, now. <clears throat> he says, uh, let's hear, okay. <clears throat> Brethren, I speak as a man of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannuls or adds thereto. In other words, once a covenant, once a contract has been signed, nobody takes away from it, nobody adds to it, it's done. So he's trying to give you a, a, a natural analogy. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. You hear that? He saith not, now listen, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not and to seeds as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. Now do you hear that? So when God made a promise to Abraham, he wasn't talking to a bunch of people. He was talking to Abraham and to one other person, his seed, Christ. You got that? He wasn't talking to all the people in the Middle East. He wasn't talking to all these people that claimed to be sons of Abraham. He was talking to Abraham and one seed, which is Christ. Do you see that there? Is that in your Bible? Right? Do you see it? Are we, are, we, are we settled on that? We're good, right? Okay, I'm not making that up. I didn't write it in there. It's in your Bible, right? So the seed, the promise was made to Abraham and to his seed, Christ. Not his seed, many people. Right? Which also means not you. Right? I'll show you. Don't get scared. Watch. Okay. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ which was what? Which was the law, which was 430 years afterward, cannot, what? Disannul, right? In other words, he's saying, look, God made a promise to Abraham, and then 430 years later, the law came. And when the law came, because the law came later, it couldn't disannul with the promise made to Abraham. But the law was not the promise made to Abraham. The law was added because of transgression. You're going to say that in just a minute. So you have to differentiate between the covenant or the promise that was made with Abraham and the law. See, the covenant with Abraham is what Jesus fulfilled. The law is what was done away. The law was only added until Christ came. Well, I'm, I'm just getting ahead of myself. It's all right here. But I want you to read it, right? So I hope you're, hope you're reading out of your Bible. He says, But the law, the law, which was 430 years afterward, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. So adding the law didn't stop the promise. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, right? So you have a difference between law and promise. Now, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. God didn't give Abraham a law. The law came by Moses, right? So God didn't give Abraham a law. He gave Abraham a promise. He gave Moses a law. And giving Moses a law didn't change the promise made to Abraham. Amen? Now, wherefore then serveth the law? What good is it? It was added because of transgressions. How long? What's the next part? Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Now, who is that? Christ, right? Now, so the law was added until Christ came. When Christ came, the law was done away. So you cannot be under the law. Right? Okay. Okay. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one. In other words, a mediator doesn't represent one side. A mediator is neutral and represents both sides. That's all he's trying to say. 
but God is one. And what he's saying here is that God made a covenant with Abraham, and the covenant with Abraham was really a covenant with Jesus, and God was making a covenant with Jesus, and Abraham was the physical representation because Jesus was going to come out of Abraham in his physical body, right? And so God was really not making the covenant so much with Abraham as he was between him and Jesus. Now, the beauty of that is it's God making a covenant with himself that Abraham got to be a part of. Now, that's a pretty good deal, right? Now, watch. Is the law then against the promises of God? No, of course not. God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, then verily righteousness should have been by the law. But we know that there is no law, and there could be no life, no righteousness by the law, so it wasn't, right? But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin. Why? So that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Not by law, but by promise. And how do you get into that promise? By faith in Jesus Christ. Now, but before faith came. Now, now watch, watch this. Before faith came, we were kept under the law. So that means when faith came, we weren't under the law anymore, right? Okay. We were shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. What was the purpose of the law? To bring us to Christ. Okay? Now, why? That we might be justified by faith. In other words, the law was added for transgressions because we kept messing up. So it showed you your sin. So you go, I can't do this myself. And then we say, oh, look, somebody did it for you. So come to Christ. And then you come into Christ and ask by faith. And then because of that, it brings us to Christ. We get born again. And now we're in the promise. Amen? Now, this, is, this is good news right here. This is the heart of the gospel right here. Right? And watch. But after that faith is come... We are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now, what was a schoolmaster? The law. Once faith comes, once you have faith in Christ, you're no longer under the law. Correct? Okay. Now, watch. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now, notice everybody's not the children of God. You're the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. If you don't have faith in Christ Jesus, you're not the children of God. There are two families in this world. There are children of God and children of the devil. Okay? Now, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You get that? Now, there is neither Jew nor Greek. End of story. Right? Neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And, now watch this. And if you be Christ's, Right? And what that means is if you belong to him. Right? It's not saying if you are Christ. It's saying if you belong to Christ. If you are Christ's property. If you belong to him. Then are you Abraham's seed. Singular, not plural. Why? Because you're in him. You understand? Now, remember that I said that the promise was made to Abraham and his seed? One as of Christ, not as of many. That's why I said it wasn't made to you. Because it wasn't made to you. It was made to Christ. But when you get in Christ, it's no longer you that live. But now Christ. You know what he said? It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. So it's not about you, it's about Christ. And when you get in Christ, you get all the benefits of Christ, and it's not about you anymore. So God didn't promise you blessings, he didn't promise you anything, he promised Christ something. And when you get in Christ, you get everything he promised Christ, not what he promised you, because he didn't promise you anything. You understand? That's why how, how you minister has nothing to do with who you are or what you've done. It's all in him. Why? Because it's no longer you that live. Quit trying to live. Right? See, your, your life is hidden in him. Quit sticking your head out. As long as you're hidden in him, the devil can't find you. But every time you stick your head out and go, oh, my ministry, my anointing, my gifting, the devil's right there to pop you in the face. Right? So just stay hidden in Christ. It's no longer that Christ that lives, but what? It's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. Right? Yeah. He says... And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Stop right there. Who's the heirs according to the promise? We are. You know what he said? He said, if you're in Christ, right? Now watch. And if you be in Christ, we'll say Christ there, then are you Abraham's seed. Why? Because you're in Christ. You cease to exist. Now it's Christ. So you and Christ are one. So it's no longer you but him because you're in him. And if you're in him, then you are Abraham's seed. Right? 
Now, and if you're Abraham's seed, then you are also heirs. Now, this is the first time you see the word, a plural word there, heirs. Why? Because he recognizes that we are individual humans, you know, here, right? But he's trying, to, he's trying to get across to you. But if you're in Christ, what you do is not as an individual human, but it's because of who you are in Christ that you get the blessing of God upon you because you are a joint heir with Christ, which means you get everything he got. Right? Yes. Now watch. I'm telling you, this is good news. I, man, I'm telling you, this is good stuff. He says, watch. Then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Heirs according to the promise. What was the promise? That we might receive the Spirit right? The promise was that the Spirit of God would dwell in us. That's why Christ was the first one to receive the promise of the Spirit that was promised to Abraham. Remember when he went to the River Jordan with baptized? He was the first one to receive the baptism of the Spirit, right? And he was the first one to walk in that promise that was given to Abraham that the Spirit of God will dwell in you and make his habitation in you. Right? And then he said, and if you come into Christ, guess what? You're promised that same thing. Why? Because it was promised to Christ. And if you're in Christ, you get what Christ got because you're joint heirs. Amen? All right, now watch. He says, and heirs according to the promise. Now watch. Who's the heirs? You're the heirs. Right? Is that right? Are you sure? Is that your final answer? Okay, I can't talk you out of it. Right? You're sure. Okay? Okay. I just want to make sure. Okay? Yeah, because I don't want to give you a way to, to you know, squirm out of it. I want to back you into a corner where you got nowhere to go, right? So, you are the heirs, right? Oh, you are quiet now. Okay. Okay, this is not a trick. Just read it in your Bible. Is that what he says? If you are in Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to promise. Is that you? Okay. Can anybody take that away from you? It's yours. Okay. Now, just want to make sure. Go to, go to chapter 4. Now I say that the heir... Who's the heir? You are. Okay, just making sure you didn't get lost somewhere between the last verse. Okay. I say that the heir, as long as he is a child. Hmm, we've been talking about children today, haven't we? Babies in Christ, child, carnal. Right? Okay, milk, there you go. Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, as long as he's carnal, as long... See, now watch. He differs nothing from a servant. Though he be Lord of all. Now, who's Lord of all? Uh, wait for your answer. Because automatically we say Jesus. That's true. He is Lord, he's King of kings and Lord of lords. What lords is he Lord of? Us. Now, watch. Now, I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, differs nothing from a servant, the heir, that you. As long as you're a babe in Christ, as long as you're a child, as long as you're carnally minded, as long as you live on milk and you don't do the meat and you don't grow up, as long as you do that, you're a servant. What is a servant? A servant doesn't know what his master does, Jesus said. A servant has to be told what to do, when to do, and how to do it. But a son knows. Jesus, at the time Jesus was talking about that, there were no sons except for him. So he said, but a friend knows. Why, why did he call him a friend? Because he couldn't call him sons yet. But the friend was, is, became the son. So, if, as long as you're a child, you'll differ nothing from a servant. But once you grow up, you quit being a servant. In other words, you quit, you, you are different from a servant. But notice here he says, even though the heir, as long as he's a child, he differs nothing from a servant, even though the heir, the child, is Lord of all. So who's Lord of all? You are. He said, oh, no, you can't say it. No, no, remember, quit dividing what God has joined together. If Jesus is Lord of all, and it's no longer you that live, but Christ that lives in you, then you in Christ, you're Lord of all too because you're joint heirs with him and whatever he gets, you got. So if he's Lord of all, you're Lord of all. Yes. See the responsibility now? See, we think, oh, wow, Lord of all. I, I got power. I got a, no, 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 no. You're missing it. It's, it's responsibility. Yes. See, throughout the years, there have been people who have gotten a hold of this message and started walking in it, but invariably the enemy comes in and, and for some reason they get off of the idea of responsibility as sons and they start trying to call themselves this and well I'm, I'm this, I have this revelation and I'm this and you're not this and I'm above you and, and as soon as you start getting to that you get away from being who you're supposed to be and you get into lording over one another and you cease being who you're supposed to be and you don't take responsibility. A son takes responsibility. A servant doesn't take responsibility. I'm just doing what I'm told. It ain't my fault, I got nothing to do with it. 
You, you get this? Now watch, let's go on, I'll prove it. Now I say that the heir, that you, as long as he is a child, carnal, central, milk, all that kind of stuff, differs nothing from a servant, has to be told what to do and when to do and how to do it and all that kind of stuff, which is where most Christians are. God, tell me what to do and when to do, and if you tell me to go do it, I'll do it, but until you tell me to do it, I'm not moving because I don't want to make you mad and do something wrong. So you just tell me what, no, that's what a servant does. But a son knows, see, a, that's why Jesus said, the son knows what his master does or what his father does, amen? Jesus said, I, why did you come looking for me? Don't you know I got to be about my father's business? That's what he was doing. I'm about my father's business. I, you don't have to ask to be about your father's business. You just go be about it. Why? Because it's yours. It's all yours. Right? Remember the prodigal son? Remember the elder brother? Everybody always talks about the prodigal son, but the story is really about the elder brother mainly. Because the elder brother got mad because the prodigal son went off and did all the wrong things and came back in and the father blessed him and then the elder brother says, well, you didn't do that for me. And the whole key goes back to that verse. He said, you were with me all the time. You could have went and got a calf anytime you wanted to. The fact that you didn't do it shows you didn't think enough of yourself to do it. You're more worried about what I gave your brother than what you already had access to. That's Christians. They get mad whenever somebody comes in. Maybe they've been in church you know, 20 years, and then somebody gets saved off the street, gets set free from crack, gets set free from drugs, alcohol, all this kind of stuff, comes in, throws himself down, and God heals them, bam. Well, bless God, I've been Sunday school superintendent, I've been, try- I've been tithing, and I've been trying to get healed for 10 years, and God won't heal me, and God just healed, that ain't right. Well, I'm sorry, elder brother. <laughs> God's not the one determining when you get healed. You could have went and got your healing any time you wanted to. Why? Because it was already done. Do you get that? Do you see the freedom in this? It's amazing. People ask me all the time, would you pray about coming here? Nope, I won't do it. I won't pray about coming there. I will go. I don't have to pray. He told me to go into all the world. I don't have to pray about going into all the world. If you live somewhere in the world, I will come. <laughs> right? Now, if you move to the moon, I may not come. <laughs> right? Because he hadn't told me to evangelize the moon. <laughs> right? But if you live in the world, might as well come. And if you invite me, might as well come when you invite me. Right? So I don't have to pray about that. Now, we may have to work out the details of the timing and that kind of stuff, but as far as whether I will come, there's no question. I don't ever ask God about where I go. I just, I, I tell him, God, now, I will do this sometimes. I'll say, God, we haven't been in this area. We need to go there. So I need somebody from there to contact me. And usually within a week to 10 days, somebody will call me from there and say, would you come? We'll say, yep, we'll be glad to come. So we do that a lot of times. Why? Because I will go anywhere in the world. I don't care. Right? Now, I tried to get to the rough places while I was young because it's easier to go to the rough places when you're young. That way, when you get old, God will give you all the easy places. <laughs> all right? So, <clears throat> so, now, he says, watch this. Now, I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. I've got to keep repeating that to you because you've got to realize you are Lord of all because you're in Christ and because Jesus is Lord of all. Because of that, you have authority. It's not yours, it's his. When you speak, he speaks. If they receive you, they receive him. If they don't receive you, they don't receive him. Come on now, we can go back to it and, and look. You need to go back and read the gospel sometimes and read all these things Jesus said about the people, how, how much union you have with him. And he said, when you do that, now, as, as, a, he, as a king, he is king of kings and lord of lords. Well, you're the kings and you're the lords. In Revelation, it tells us that we are made kings and priests under our God. Well, you're the kings that he's king over. Right? And you're the Lord's, he's Lord over. Now the thing is, you can Lord over everything except other people. <laughs> right? And unfortunately, that's the one thing everybody wants to Lord over. But you, you can absolutely Lord over everything that creeps on the earth, crawls upon the face of the earth, swims, flies through the air, and you have total authority over all that stuff. Why? In Christ, you have authority over that. Now, guess what? Germs crawl. Right? They fly. Right? You have authority over that. You can tell it. Die in Jesus' name. And that thing will whoosh, whoosh, that, there it is. This guy's. Amen? You have authority to do that. Now, <clears throat> watch. He says, but is, though he be, Lord, now he's, notice he's saying, the, the child, the, the heir, as long as he's a child, differs nothing from a servant, even though he's, now you realize he was Lord of all the whole time? But he just doesn't walk in it because he still thinks like a servant has to be told what to do because he's a child. But when he starts to grow up, he doesn't have to be told what to do. He knows what to do. Why? Because his, he has his senses exercised by reason of use to discern what is good and evil. That's right. That's wrong. Do this. Don't do that. You be healed. That's it. Not you be, stay sick. You don't tell people that. But you, you know what I'm saying? 
But you just tell them, you can determine this is your call. You stop this. You don't like something going on, tell it to stop. You don't like something going on in your country, tell it to stop. You can, you can start to dictate the situation. You should be the spiritual governor over your area. You, you ought to be able to go into your area of your community and say, devil, your sickness and disease is not going to stay here. And you just go door to door, knock on the door and say, hey, I'm here just here to tell you, I'm praying. And if there's anybody sick here, we'll, we will take care of that right now because we are absolutely eradicating sickness and disease from my area of operations. Right? <laughs> so, right. Now, look, don't go up there. No, if, if you're going to walk up and go, excuse me, um, we're praying for people and there's people and we, we, we believe that, that God can heal. And we just, and we just think that we just like, you know, we just think that Jesus, if you're sick, that you might want to get healed. And we just don't, we think he could do it. And so, okay, if you're going to do that, don't waste your time. I mean, if you, I, mean I believe in healing. If you came to my door, I'd shut the door on you. <laughs> right? I, I'd tell you, go back and, you know, go back and believe what you're saying. Go back and get some conviction. Right? And then come back and talk to me. But don't come to me mealy mouth and, I, I don't know what Jesus, what we just say? No, don't waste your time. If you're going to do it, step up there and tell them what you're doing. Listen, anybody here sick? Can, oh, grandma's sick in the back room? Can I, can I see her? And then go back there and just put your hands on her and say, in Jesus' name, be healed and watch. Right? And it, forget the people and just re- realize, tell the devil, devil, you cannot stay in this community. You understand? Yeah, I know. Apparently, I haven't got you convinced yet. But we're getting there. So, he says here, watch. Though he be Lord of all, but... As long as he's a child, he is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father, which is the time that you grow up. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage. Were. You hear that were? It's a past tense word, right? We were in bondage under the elements of the world. You hear that? Paul said as long as we were children, we were under, el- under bondage to the elements of the world. That means when we grew up, the elements of the world didn't hold us in bondage anymore. We started dictating to the elements of the world, not having it dictated to us. Amen? When I went to South Africa recently, the raft we flew in, the volcano went off, and everybody said, oh, you may have to stay here a while. And I said, no, i got places to go. I've got to be in Australia in two weeks. That, that we will get a window, it will clear, and we'll fly out. And we did, and after we did, it came back up again. <laughs> Amen? He said, you really think you had something to do with that? Yeah, I sure do. <laughs> if I didn't think God answered my prayers, I wouldn't pray. If I pray, I expect my prayers to get answered. Yeah. Amen? He said, whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do. Amen? Come on, at least believe your own prayers if you can't believe somebody else's, right? Okay. He said, we were under bondage to the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons... God hath, past tense. Remember what I told you about the past tense of God's word? It's amazing. You read the epistles, everything's past tense. Everybody's waiting for God to do something? Mm-mm, he's done it. God's waiting on you to do something with what he's done. Okay? God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, watch this, thou art no more a servant. You're not a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir, an heir of God through Christ. You hear that? Now, listen, you're not a servant. People introduce me all the time, let's welcome the servant of God. And it, it, I hear that, but it's not true. I'm not a servant. I'm a son who serves. I'm not saying I don't serve. I'm just not a servant. See, there's a big difference between a servant and a son. Now, we don't have a lot of that today, but if you go to one of these stores, right, like a McDonald's or something like that, you've got employees. And then you have the owner of the store, the franchise owner or something like that. He owns it, okay? Now, the employees, when the owner walks in, man, they're, you know, they start sweeping and they get real busy when he walks in the door, right? Because they're a servant. But the son, whenever the, the, if the son's there, when the father walks in, the owner, the son doesn't change anything. Why? Because he's not the owner, he's dad, right? He still does the same. See, the servant says, uh, can I take my break now? And the son says, I'm going on break. You understand? That's the difference. The, the problem is you don't see yourself as a son yet. You still think you have to get permission for everything. God said, you don't have to ask me. Do what you want. Go into all the world. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. Have fun. Just, just go have fun. Just play. Amen? 
Now, you have to realize, you have the authority to do that anywhere. A policeman doesn't have authority on one street. He has authority anywhere he's at. Why? Because if they taught enough of him to give him the authority, then they gave him enough authority to handle anything anywhere. He, a policeman doesn't have the authority to handle some crimes and not other ones because they're too big for him. He, he has the authority to stop any crime he sees. Right? It's the same thing with you. You're a son. But you're also God's policeman. Your job is to see the problem and fix it. You keep fixing it until it looks like heaven. Real simple. Amen? This is good stuff. Amen? <laughs> I'm telling you, this is how we live. This is what we do. And I'm telling you, it's good. It is so easy. I don't live by rules. But yet I keep the rules. Isn't that amazing? It's because I don't have to worry about the rules. See, people are always worried about the rules. What are they doing? They're always looking at themselves. How am I keeping the rule? I don't have to look at myself. I can look at the people that need help, and I can help them. And even if I make a mistake and mess up and break a rule, I know that God is big enough to override that. Why? Because I'm moving on into the grace of God and moving in and just doing what? I'm helping others. I'm loving God and loving my fellow man. Amen? Now, here, I, and we're going to send you a break here in just a second. I'm trying. I'm trying here, okay? And watch. He says, Wherefore there art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Howbeit then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. In other words, you served devils and thought you were serving God, and you didn't know what you were doing, but you were still... You notice it didn't say, well, that didn't count, because it did. You were still serving devils even though you were serving God. You thought you were serving God, right? He said, but now... After you have known God, or rather are known of God, how, why, how, turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? He said, if you did that whenever you were, didn't know God, why now when you know God, you'll go back under those things and live as though you don't know God? And then watch, he says, you observe days and months and times and years. The feast, you watch, you, you, you have to get your offering in by the day of atonement or God's not going to bless you. That's a lie. You understand? Well, we got to keep the feast because those are... No, you don't. Jesus kept the feast. You keep Jesus. Amen? If you keep Jesus, he kept the feast. You're good. Right? Now, you can look at the feast and recognize him in the feast. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't think that you're keeping the feast gives you any favor with God. Nothing you can do can give you more favor than you've got. You understand? Man, this is good stuff. Now, I mean, you talk about freedom. It's amazing. He says, I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. I've come there, I've worked, I've poured this stuff out, and I'm afraid now because I hear you're following these feasts and going back under the law, and you're doing it. My goodness, what are you doing? Why would you do it? Why would you go back under the law and try to finish in the flesh what was started in the Spirit? Come back under the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what he kept telling them. Amen? Just be free. Amen. Take a break. Okay, break's over. Let's get started. Let's, go. <laughs> Let's make it quick, though. You got to.